thank you everybody for being here. Uh, good evening and welcome. Delighted to be your host this evening for the Martin Ridge Lecture in Literature, which is the fourth in the series of public lectures in the humanities run by the research division here at the Huntington. The Ridge Lecture was established in 1992 in honour of my predecessor but one, Martin Ridge, on the occasion of his retirement. And although Martin was uh, an especially esteemed historian of the American West, it was his wish that the theme of the lecture always be on a literary topic. And recent lecturers have included James Shapiro, Paul Theroux and Hilary Mantel. So to join that pedigree, I'm delighted to welcome this evening's lecturer, Namwali Serpel, who is Professor of English in the Department of English at Harvard University, where she, a department which she joined this summer. She holds her first degree from Yale and her MA and PhD from Harvard and subsequently held fellowships from Stanford at the Humanities Center and at the Townsend Center for the Humanities at Berkeley. She's the author of Seven Modes of Uncertainty, which appeared in 2014, and Stranger Faces, which appeared earlier this year. However, her reputation rests primarily on a remarkable novel uh, published in 2019 entitled The Old Drift, a novel which has been immensely successful, having been awarded the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Science Fiction, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Fiction that Confronts Racism and Explores Diversity, the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize for Fiction, and the LA Times Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction. In 2019, it appeared on the New York Times list of 100 notable books and Time Magazine's list of 100 must-read books. In recent months, she's been exploring the history of the musical and literary genre known as Afrofuturism. And it's on that topic that she'll be talking this evening. The presentation is pre-recorded. It lasts about 50 minutes. So please feel free either during the presentation or immediately after its conclusion to submit questions through the Q&A function. We look forward to discussing these themes with you. But in the meantime, please welcome the 2021 Ridge Lecturer, Professor Namwali Sapel. Thanks so much, Steve, for having me and to the Huntington uh, Library for having me. It's a great privilege and honor to be able to share some of my research with you all today. And I look forward to an engaging and exciting conversation after, uh, after the talk. Thank you. Black Matters. We started from the bottom, now we're here. What does it mean to come from nowhere? What does it mean to come from nothing, to emerge ex nihilo? What does it mean to build an identity or a politics or an art out of negative space, out of black matter? Let me tell you a story about blackness. Let me tell you a story about a boy. On May 22nd, 1914, a black boy named Herman Poole Blount was born in Birmingham, Alabama. His mother was a waitress and he never knew his father. Some say his mother named him after her favorite stage performer, the vaudeville stage illusionist and magician, Black Herman. Black Herman reportedly performed all manner of tricks, levitation, rabbit conjure, escape acts, as well as an elaborately blasphemous miracle. Black Herman would be buried alive in Black Herman's private graveyard, exhumed three days later, and make a triumphant return to the stage to finish the show. With, that, with such a phantasmagoric and bold performer for a namesake, it's no surprise that young Herman Blount, nicknamed Sonny, also became a child prodigy. A skilled pianist, by the age of 11 or 12, Sonny was composing and sight-reading music. As a teenager, he could reproduce from memory the big band concerts that came through Birmingham, led by greats like Duke Ellington and Fats Waller. While attending high school, Sonny began performing as a solo pianist and in a handful of jazz and R&B bands, including one headlined by his biology teacher. Sonny spent the rest of his spare time at the Black Mason Lodge, 
feeding his voracious appetite for books. An honor roll graduate, he got a scholarship in 1936 to study music education at the Alabama Agricultural and Mechanical University. Sonny was well on his way to becoming a musician. The kind of musician he would become took a radical turn a year later. Sonny had a vision. My whole body changed into something else. I could see through myself. I wasn't in human form. I landed on a planet that I identified as Saturn. They teleported me and I was down on stage with them. They wanted to talk with me. They had one little antenna on each ear, a little antenna over each eye. They talked to me. They told me to stop attending college because there was going to be great trouble in schools. The world was going into complete chaos. I would speak through music and the world would listen. That's what they told me. After this vision, which would vary little over the course of its many retellings, Sonny dropped out of college and became beset, became obsessed with music, space travel, and every manner of esoterica. He rarely slept, citing Da Vinci and Edison as his forefathers in the art of the genius cat map. He transformed the first floor of his family home in Alabama into a kind of erstwhile salon where he would write, transcribe, record, and rehearse songs and ideas with local musicians and drifters passing through. A collective, a galaxy, sunny at the center as others revolved around him. This suited him well. When he was 28 years old, the United States went to war. It was 1942 and Sonny got drafted. He declared himself a conscientious objector, citing religious objections to war and murder, his financial support of his relatives and a medical condition, a chronic testicular hernia. When he failed to show up for the alternate service assigned to him, he got arrested. In court, Mr. Blount, representing himself, debated the judge on points of legal and biblical interpretation. When the judge ruled that he had violated the law and ought to be conscripted anyhow, Sonny Blount claimed that he'd kill the first high-ranking military officer he saw. The judge sentenced him to Walker County Jail saying, quote, I've never seen a nigger like you before. Sonny replied, quote, no, and you never will again. When his conscientious objector status was reaffirmed in 1943, Sonny was escorted to his alternate service in Pennsylvania. He practiced forestry during the day and played piano at night. Psychiatrists there described him as, quote, a psychopathic personality, quote, and, quote, sexually perverted, end quote. They also described him as, quote, a well-educated colored intellectual, end quote. After a month, he was classified as 4F for his hernia and returned home. He headed to Chicago three years later in 1946 to reignite his musical career. Chicago. Political activism, fringe movements, Black Hebrews, Black Muslims, with its Art Deco buildings and monuments modeled on ancient Egypt, Chicago was Sonny's mecca. He drank the city down, its wild jazz and cabaret scene. Skipping from band to band, he finally formed his own, the orchestra. And on October 20th, 1952, riffing on the Egyptian god of the sun. He changed his stage name to La Sunny Ra, or Sun Ra for short. Herman Blount, he said, was a slave name. In the mid-1950s, Sun Ra and his orchestra, an ever-evolving ensemble with an ever-revolving cast of musicians, began wearing outlandish, hieratic, futuristic costumes and headdresses. Their look was hybrid. African and ancient Egyptian motifs mingled with space age tropes. Africa and the planet Saturn overlaid in a palimpsest of past and future black utopias. Their sound was synthetic too, drawing from big band and swing, hard bop, modal music, reggae, Afropop, electronic music, and Walt Disney musicals. I'm gonna play uh, a 30 second clip here. What do you do when you know that you know that you know that you're wrong? What do you do when you know that you know that you know that you're wrong? 
song. We got to face the music. We got to listen. Ra's philosophy, expressed in his music, his poetry, and a slew of pamphlets, bespoke an equally broad diversity. Kabbalah, Gnosticism, Freemasonry, many mysticisms, Black nationalism, and Zen. Yet Ra always claimed a method to all this, a metaphysical basis for what he called his equations. Replete with cones and runes, esoterica and etymology, numerology and non sequiturs. Sun Ra was featured on the April 19, 1969 cover of Rolling Stone magazine in a photograph called Eyes Wide Shut. His own eyes are mysteriously hidden behind bug shades as if to protect himself from his own dazzle. He and the orchestra were at the time in the midst of their first tour of the West Coast. By now, the post vaudevillian performance included 20 to 30 musicians, dancers, singers, fire eaters, and even eerie visual effects. Two years later, in 1971, Sun Ra was appointed artist in residence at the University of California, Berkeley, where I taught from 2008 until this past year. Sun Ra taught a course called The Black Man in the Cosmos. Apart from volumes on Egyptian hieroglyphs and African-American folklore, his syllabus also included writings by the 19th century Russian occultist and medium Madame Blavatsky and the work of Henry Dumas, a black poet who was gunned down by the New York City Transit in 1968. Sun Ra assigned his students the Tibetan Book of the Dead and George G. M. James' 1954 Stolen Legacy, which claimed that Greek philosophy had been filched from ancient Egypt. Few students enrolled but Sun Ra's classes were often crammed with curious or stone stragglers from the streets of Berkeley, which were littered with the same detritus of activism and weird that Sunny had found in Chicago. Half of each class was devoted to an orchestra performance or a Sun Ra solo on the keys, and the other half to a lecture. I'm gonna just play you two minutes so you get a, a sense of uh, what Sun Ra's lectures sounded like. See, when people are taught something is good, and then uh, they don't investigate it, and then they talk to have faith, but you shouldn't do that. You're supposed to uh, be intelligent, so you need some equations. You can read all kind of books with all kind of theories, like I got some books here from India and other places, and Tibet and all that, and this book here. All these are good books, but they're not doing like I'm doing. They don't have any equations. So I really can't respect anybody can write a book, or they can go out and they can research and get a little bit from this book, a little bit from this book, and you think they're very learned and they don't know anything. But when they come up with some equations, you have to start judging men by equations because there are so many voices in the world that uh, it's very difficult to tell who's telling the truth. But even if they tell the truth, if it doesn't benefit you, you don't need it anyway because you have so many other things to think about. So now you got the kind of planet, this planet is vulnerable to any kind of uh, creature, uh, any kind of being to come on any time they want and pretend to be a man or a woman or a child and come up and tell you anything. It's because since you're not in a sort of brotherhood where you protect your brothers and you look out after each other, anything can come on the planet and grab one of your brothers and take him to the moon or Jupiter anywhere. You don't look out after one another. You don't know what's happening on the planet. So since you don't have that uh, vibrational uh, thing of protecting one another, of course this planet is vulnerable. Some people could come from outer space and take the whole thing over because you never notice what's happening and you don't care about it because you think you're just like snug bugs on a rug. You think, I'm safe, it's all right, things are gonna be all right, everything happens for the best. So Sun Ra might sound to you here like a kook that you might find ranting on the streets of Berkeley. This was the height of the Cold War, paranoia was already in style. But Ra's underlying message about equations and vibrations is attuned to black politics. The specific threat of aliens grabbing us was not just a fear born of an invasion of the body snatchers. There are echoes of black history here, being snatched from Africa, being snatched from your family, being snatched out of your life by unwarranted arrest and sometimes unjustified murder by the New York City Transit. 
In his inaugural definition of Afrofuturism in 1992, the critic Mark Derry says, African Americans in a very real sense are the descendants of alien abductees. They inhabit a sci-fi nightmare in which unseen but no less impassable force fields of intolerance frustrate their movements. Official histories undo what has been done to them and technology, be it branding, forced sterilization, the Tuskegee experiment or tasers is too often brought to bear on black bodies. While Derry notes the scarcity of Afrofuturist texts in this interview and this essay, he points to Samra as one clear origin of the phenomenon, in particular, the 1974 film, Space is the Place. Over the course of his California dreaming, Samra's work had come to the attention of Jim Newman, a jazz musician and filmmaker. And in 1974, using some of Ra's Berkeley lectures as a basis, they made a film together. The insane premise of Space is the Place is that Ra is going to, quote, set up a colony for Black people, bring them to Saturn through transmolecularization, or teleport the whole planet here through music. Here's a little clip while uh, Ra explores the planet to scope out its potential for this mass migration. is different here. The vibrations are different. It's not like Planet Earth. Planet Earth sound of guns, anger, frustration. There was no one to talk to from Planet Earth to understand. We set up a colony for black people here. See what they can do on the planet all their own without any white people there. They could drink in the beauty of this. So you can imagine this is 20 years before the term Afrofuturism is even coined. While it begins on Saturn and travels to the Chicago of Ra's youth and the Egypt of his imagination, much of Space is the Place takes place in Oakland. Oakland in the 1970s was the ideal location to explore Ra's outlandish politics. The Black Panther Party was born in Oakland in 1966. When Space is the Place was being filmed, the Panthers were at a moment of transition. In 72, the party had closed its national centers to focus on building operations on the ground. The Black Panther Party remained relevant and popular due to its grassroots programs and its infiltration into local politics. Oakland at the time was also a hotbed of Black cultural production from music, to poetry. It was also a time of rampant unemployment and racial tension in the city. In the film, Sun Ra goes to a youth center to recruit Black teenagers to colonize Saturn. And he tells them, I'm not real. I'm just like you. You don't exist in this society. If you did, your people wouldn't be seeking equal rights. You're not real. If you were, you'd have some status among the nations of the world. So we're both myths. I do not come to you as a reality. I come to you as the myth, because that's what Black people are, myths. Midway through Space is the Place, we visit the Outer Space Employment Agency. Inside, a building under a billboard that says, if your job puts you to sleep, try one of ours. Ra, adorned in a silver Egyptian flavored helmet and a black robe bespeckled with stars trimmed in sparkle, sits inside a glass booth. He interviews various Bay Area residents, a white NASA engineer, a blonde hippie, who want to join Outer Spaceways Incorporated. 
a middle-aged black man approaches the window. My oh, man, what's happening? Everything is happening. What is this? I mean, uh, where am I? You know, uh, who is you? I'm everything and nothing. Nothing? Well, you better tell me about this nothing stuff, because uh, I need a job, and I don't, I don't know what to do. What have you been doing lately? Uh, 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 nothing, really, nothing. How long have you been doing nothing? <laughs> Quite some time. Quite some time. You must be an expert at it. I got my BA. <laughs> we'll hire you to do that. How much I get paid, man? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing? I got to have something so I can get me another bottle. I can't go for that shit. <laughs> In a city where unemployment and drug use had long been a scourge for black men, the class commentary here is searing. The notion of doing nothing also taps the history of treating the black inner city as a wasteland. It's the same wordplay that Ralph Ellison overheard in 1948. In Harlem, the reply to the greeting, how are you, is very often, oh man, I'm nowhere. One is literally, but one is nowhere. One wanders dazed in a ghetto maze, a displaced person of American democracy. Negro Americans, Ellison goes on, are in desperate search for an identity. Rejecting the second class status assigned to them, they feel alienated and their whole lives have become a search for answers to the questions, who am I, what am I, why am I, and where? Or as the wino in Sun Ra's film Spaces the Place says, what is this? I mean, what like, uh, where am I? You know, uh, who is you? Sun Ra's intersectional analysis of Oakland is lighter than Ellison's analysis of Harlem, which is where I now live. Ra is more satirical than cynical. But don't let the jazzy counterpoint of the wino's slangy slur and Ra's wry zen disguise the metaphysics at play in this scene from Space is the Place. Ra says, I'm everything and nothing. This to me is Black Samuel Beckett, or perhaps more apropos for Oakland, Black Gertrude Stein. Whether it is modernist poetry, garbled existentialism, or stoner talk, Ra understands at a fundamental level that Black life is built in this country on negation. So how do we build from a ground zero? How do we get to everything from nothing? The word utopia means an imagined place or state of perfection, but its etymology is utopos or not place. In Franz Fanon's revolutionary work of black philosophy, black skin, white masks, he aspires to a place and time elsewhere. I am not merely here and now sealed into thingness. I am for somewhere else for something else. I demand that notice be taken of my negating activity insofar as I pursue something other than life, insofar as I do battle for the creation of a human world. For Fanon, that elsewhere would be our own human world, one that acknowledges a Black person as human. For Sun Ra, the Afrofuturist, that elsewhere is outer space with all its dark, rich potential. The unknown is great, Ra once said. It's like the darkness. Nobody made that, it just happens. Light and all that, someone made that. It's written that they did. But nobody made the darkness. My music is about dark tradition. Dark tradition means a lot more than black tradition. This dark tradition both is exactly and goes beyond a black tradition. We might call this Sun Ra's negative theology. It permeates his poetry in poems like Tomorrow is Never. The future is never, never comes tomorrow, never is not. Behold the pre-prophetic symbols of the plains of never. Behold, behold this thisness, this isness. Sun Ra's poem, The No Point, shows how light can come out of this darkness. 
Out of nowhere, they come like embers suddenly aflame with living reach, spiral infinity being. Yes, out of nowhere, they come from the no point. Sun Ra's negative theology wrangles immense beauty and radical art out of absence. And I don't mean the ascetic or antiseptic purity of negative space. I mean everything and nothing in counterpoint. Ra's music is a case in point, skittering as it does between sounds and non-sounds, between sparkling notes and yawning vacuums, always attuned to that absent beat that makes a rhythm a rhythm at all. Space is the place is another example. Even its title seems to invoke the all and the nothing, the everything and the no place, the space and the place of a utopic elsewhere, perhaps on Saturn, perhaps beyond. As Mark Derry continues in his essay, Defining Afrofuturism, can a community whose past has been deliberately rubbed out and whose energies have subsequently been consumed by the search for legible traces of its history imagine possible futures. I think Ra's negative theology is a primary example of how Afrofuturism plays with absence, with this rubbed out past, and renders it a possible future. This is the futurism in Afrofuturism, the forward-looking politics that is grounded in science fictional aesthetics and, as we've seen, in Black humor. But when's the Afro in Afrofuturism? Note that the beginning of Derry's quote here discusses the concept in relation to African-Americans. We all know, however, that abduction, intolerance, dismemberment, experiments, and weaponry have been inflicted on Black bodies in Africa, too. And as I've suggested, Ra's iconography borrows heavily from Egypt and the idea that Greek philosophy had been stolen from ancient African cultures. What is it about the so-called heart of darkness that might appeal to a Black artistic praxis keyed to negation? As it turns out, a decade before Sun Ra started sketching out his plans to migrate to Saturn, a man in the middle of Africa was launching a space program. So let me tell you another story about Blackness. This one I'll tell backwards. It starts with a country. On October 24th, 1964, my country was born. The British protectorate formerly known as Northern Rhodesia would now be known as Zambia, taking its new name from the great Zambezi River. Time Magazine announced the news of this new nation with a rather unusual closing paragraph. One noted Zambian failed to share in all the harmony. He is Edward Mukuka Mkoloso, a grade school science teacher and the director of Zambia's National Academy of Science, Space Research and Philosophy, who claimed the goings on interfered with his space program to beat the US and the Soviet Union to the moon. Already Nkoloso is training 12 Zambian astronauts, including a curvaceous 16 year old girl by spinning them around a tree in an oil drum and teaching them to walk on their hands the only way humans can walk on the moon. Nkoloso wore a standard issue World War II combat helmet, a khaki military uniform and a cape, multicolored silk or heliotrope velvet with an embroidered neck, often festooned with medals. His followers wore green satin jackets with yellow trousers, but when asked, they said these were not spacesuits. Quote, no, we are the dynamite rock music group when we are not space cadets. One of Nkloso's cadets carried a Zambian flag, another a staff in the shape, quote, of a crested eagle on a dinner plate atop a Solonoff broomstick. Godfrey Mwango, at 21, was the man who could stand on his hands and had been tasked with the moon landing. Matha Mwamba, the curvaceous 16-year-old, was headed for Mars. Nkoloso's rocket, a 10-foot copper affair, was named Dikalu-1 after the nation's new president, Kenneth Kaunda. Nkoloso requested between $2 million and $7 billion from Israel, Russia, the US, UNESCO. Despite his seeming indifference as to which side of the Cold War stalemate would fund his program, he insisted on keeping its details secret. 
You cannot trust anyone in a project of this magnitude, he said. Some of our ideas are way ahead of the Americans and the Russians, and these days I will not let anyone see my rocket plants. But Uncloso did drop some clues about his African technology and do-it-yourself training techniques. As Time Magazine pointed out, he rolled his cadets down a hill in a 40 gallon oil drum to simulate the weightless conditions of the moon. I also make them swing from the end of a long rope, he said. When they reach the highest point, I cut the rope. This produces the feeling of free fall. The mololo or swinging system, he hinted, was itself a potential means of space travel. We have tied ropes to tall trees and then swung our astronauts slowly out into space. And Coloso spoke of launching his shuttle with a mukwa or catapult system and or turbulent propulsion. Because we live in a miraculous world of technology, we can still watch Uncloso and his team training uh, on uh, YouTube. So I'm going to play now. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty long clip. It's about four minutes, just so that you can see uh, exactly what Uncloso's program looked to the rest of the world, looked like to the rest of the world in 1964. Mr. Enclosure, is this the site for your rocket launching program? And, and could you tell me where your rocket is? Yes, this is the rocket launching site, and my rocket is just here. And what is the name of your organization? Uh, the name of my organization is uh, National Academy of Science, Space Research, and Ast Astronomical Research. And what position do you hold in the organization? I'm the Director General of Science, Space Research, and Philosophy. And when will you fire off your first rocket, and where will you send it to? I will, I will fight from Lusaka, and uh, it, it will go straight to the moon. It depends upon how much money I, I got. If I got enough funds, it would be very soon, or in the middle of 1965, if I got enough funds. But if not, well, it will have to make me delay longer. And what do you think the reaction of America and Russia will be to Zambia's joining in the space race? Oh, they'll be only surprised because they find, they will find that you, we are just, uh, we underestimate our, our, our resources plus the intelligence, but I'm sure we are catching them. Yes, Mr. Inclosure. Has President Kaunda given permission for your project? And has the Zambian government approved of it? Uh, no, not as yet, but uh, they, are, they have taken interest in seeing what I'm doing, because this is a novelty, there's some things you in this, need this country. Go up in the sky, jump up, one, two, Forward. Backward. Jump. Go up. 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 Go up.
And so here at an abandoned farmhouse not far from Lusaka, we have a youthful group of budding astronauts playing at entering Zambia for the world space race. However, to most Zambians, these people are just a bunch of crackpots. And from what I have seen today, I'm inclined to agree. So this British reporter's attitude toward the Zambian space program has persisted. Over the years, Nkoloso has been called, quote, a self-styled indigenous astronaut, quote, an amiable lunatic, quote, a court jester, quote, a toothless little space enthusiast, and quote, Zambia's village idiot. His name crops up in compilations like Never in, in a Million Years, A History of Hopeless Predictions, and Dumb History, The Stupidest Mistakes Ever Made. Recently, with the surge of interest in Afrofuturism, Nkoloso has been seen in a rather different light. Over the last decade or so, several works of art, a South African documentary, This is Nkoloso's Son, a BBC radio program, a Spanish art installation, a Ghanaian American short film, and a Zambian art show, have rescued Nkoloso from the annals of comic history by pronouncing him a visionary of sorts, perhaps an, an eccentric one. The Spanish artist, Cristina de Medel, who likely invented the moniker Afromont, calls the Zambian space program, quote, an optimistic story about Africa and, quote, the documentation of an impossible dream. Her whimsical exhibit consists of a series of surreal recreations, models in raffia skirts and Afro-patterned spacesuits meander across a desert landscape, fitted out with rusted machinery and impassive elephants. This is all fine and good, but there are no deserts in my country. There are no deserts in Zambia. And when you read Nkoloso's own words on the space program, and if you listen beyond the perhaps heavy Bemba accent, that conceals what is otherwise perfect English grammar and diction, you see that there seems to be a little bit more than whimsical eccentricity at work here. This is from an op-ed that Nkloso wrote um, in 64. And here's a quote from it. We've been studying Mars from our telescopes at our headquarters and are now certain Mars is populated by primitive natives. Our rocket crew is ready. Specially trained space girl Mata Mamba, two cats also specially trained, and a missionary will be launched in our first rocket. But I have warned the missionary he must not force Christianity to the people if they do not want it. I have known for a long time that Russian spies are operating in Zambia. Yes, and American spies are well over the town too. They are all trying to capture Mata and my cats. They want our space secrets. These people must be dealt with immediately after independence if I am to keep my space lead. Detention without trial for all spies is what we need. Primitive natives, a space girl as specially trained as her animals, overzealous missionaries, detention without trial for spies. To me, this reads as a parody of colonialism in Africa, refracted through a paranoid Cold War sensibility. Was this a kind of performance art in the age of Andy Kaufman and Pat Paulson, the American comedian who made a running gag of running for president six times between 1968 and 1996? Indeed, in the late 60s, when the acting press officer of the Zambian embassy in Washington, D.C., Phineas Musukwa, was asked about the space program, he called Nkoloso, quote, the Pat Paulson of Zambia. Mr. Nkoloso is actually a very well-read person, Musukwa went on. It was a big joke. When I personally interviewed the former president of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, for an essay on Nkoloso for The New Yorker, Kaunda too said it was just a joke. It wasn't a real thing, he said. He wasn't a scientist as such, but he used to do some, I can't say funny things, but many people enjoyed themselves in what he was talking about. It was more for fun than anything else. But others who knew him, 
said Incluso, had been dead earnest. He was a very intelligent man, one former government official told me. He was not a fool. He knew what was happening. He knew what was going on. And Incluso's son, who the South African documentary interviewed, but whom I also interviewed, insists that he was serious about the Zambian space program. As you may imagine, that program never got off the ground. My spacemen thought they were film stars, Nkoloso said. He complained, quote, they won't concentrate on space flight. There's too much lovemaking when they should be studying the moon. Matha Mwamba got pregnant and dropped out of the program. The program suffered from a perennial lack of funds. Nkoloso blamed, quote, imperial neo-colonialists who were, quote, scared of Zambia's space knowledge. But he tried to revive the program for years. And one letter from the archives from 1974, which is, by the way, the year of Space is the Place, thanks the Zambian government for helping Nkoloso, quote, visit NASA in the USA to witness the launching of Apollo 16 in 1972. I have not yet verified whether Nkoloso made this trip to the US, this trip halfway to the moon, as it were. In the margins of the letter um, here in blue ink, you can see there's a hand scrawled note saying his words appear, quote, conceived in the manner of fantasy and imagination. The Zambian Space Program Manifesto, the quotes of it that I've found from interviews, was indeed highly imaginative. Our spacecraft Cyclops One will soar into deep abysmal space beyond the epicycles of the seventh heaven, it proclaimed before gesturing toward how much the space race was about race. Our posterity, the black scientists, will continue to explore the celestial infinity until we control the whole of outer space. And in 1968, Incloso said, let us make a Zambian rocket today. We shall never be content to remain behind other races. This is our heavenly destiny, our natural ambition and cultural hegemony. We can see a Sun Ra-like poetry in this in hindsight. Like Sun Ra's negative theology, the philosophy that we see articulated in, in Incoloso's interviews took the long-standing condition of blackness as non-existence as a basis. My students have vowed to die, he said, and his manifesto read, they will denounce their wish to stay on earth and will swear before Mkuka and Koloso and will deny themselves forever as not belonging to this planet. Too many generations have died on this earth. I want to die out there, Koloso said, pointing at the moon. In my research on the Zambian space program, I kept encountering these allusions to death as I moved backwards through his timeline. I learned of a seditious prank that Nkoloso had pulled before he launched his space program. On the eve of Zambia's independence in 1964, he and his comrades had broken into a mortuary and bribed an attendant with a five pound note for the corpse of a white woman. They'd smeared goat's blood on it and transported it to the crowded whites only bar at the segregated Ridgeway Hotel in Lusaka. The lights went out just as they tossed the corpse on the floor of the bar. As Nkoloso told a reporter in 1988, quote, I shouted to the whites who were busy dining, drinking, and laughing. I said, white men, your time is limited. We have killed the wife of the colonial governor, and we shall soon pounce on you. The expats scattered. Nkoloso's men took their prize beer from the bar and sang, quote, militant songs in favor of the political struggle. Because as it turns out, before Uncoloso became an Afronaut, he was a freedom fighter. One working theory that Uncoloso's son told me was that the space program was in fact a cover for guerrilla training. Quote, he was teaching for the program, but hidden from the British government. Uncoloso ran what was known as the African Liberation Center, which trained fighters from the nations around Zambia that had yet to achieve independence in certain kinds of guerrilla warfare. Some of the Afronauts were self-declared members of a revolutionary youth brigade. They graffitied uh, and broadcasted propaganda, and they even concocted homemade explosives, according to Nkoloso's son. They made bombs, they burned bridges, he told me. 
Now, one piece of evidence that supports this possibility is that Nkloso was in fact arrested for this kind of political activity in the 1950s in what came to be known as the Luwingu disturbances. Nkloso had been, um, uh, had uh, mounted a civil disobedience campaign, urging his fellow villagers not to follow the orders of the chief, who he said had sold the country to the Europeans. When a warrant was issued for his arrest, Nkloso went on the run in the bush and his supporters started a riot to interfere with his arrest. Eventually he was captured, beaten, and nearly drowned. In his letters from prison, Nkloso claimed that the guards and the um, kapasus, which are African men who were hired by the British colonial system um, as, as uh, essentially as cops. He said, the messengers attempted uh, to injure me by scratching my head with scissors and beating him with sticks on the lumbar side of his body, causing quote, internal batteries and very injurious internal maims, lacerating nerves and bruising the inside of the lumbar vertebrate. I felt shock all over my body and I was spitting and passing bloody urine. I discovered uh, in the Zambian National Archives the reports of this arrest and torture and they went all the way to England at the time by telegram where they helped the man who would become the future president, Kenneth Kaunda, in his campaign to convince the British to grant Zambia its independence. Kaunda wrote about Nkoloso's political story in a pamphlet calling for nationhood. Nkoloso had already earned the reputation of being a political troublemaker in the colonial period. He was first designated a restricted person after being swept up in a raid of trade unionists in the Copper Belt Mining District of Zambia. And even earlier in 1956, he had stormed into a colonial office to protest the exhumation of African corpses from the land to make room for European settlers moving into the area. Again, this is a protest to preserve graveyards. Death lurks in the heart of the story. When Nkloso took his stand against the desecration of African cemeteries, the country was still under colonial rule. Nkloso was only a member of what was called an urban council in which Africans didn't really have any political standing but could make proposals to the administration. I found in the archives records of him proposing integrated schools uh, and um, various kinds of reforms and also pushing for, for independence. He was also head of the Riflemen's Association of, of Ndola, which is the Copper Belt area. This was a hotbed of political activism for black veterans seeking compensation, because as it turns out, like Herman Poole Blount, Nkoloso had been drafted to serve in World War II for the British in the Northern Rhodesian Regiment. Unlike Sonny Blount or Sun Ra, Nkoloso had served. Over the course of stints in Abyssinia and Burma, Nkloso was promoted up through the ranks in the Signal Corps, the communications branch of the military. He had been chosen to join the army in part because he'd been educated at a Catholic mission where he learned theology, Latin, and French. And he actually often quoted Latin uh, in his interviews. But like many at the time, Nkloso may have been offered to the British for armed service, not because he was educated, but because he was a prince. Nkoloso was Bemba royalty. You can see the scars on his temple between his ear and his, and his eye there. Um, that's the kind of royal scarification that proves that he was royalty um, in, in the Bemba tribe. It turns out the bumbling Afronaut, who was once a revolutionary freedom fighter, was born an African prince. It seems like something out of a science fiction novel. And the amazing thing is that, like Sun Ra, Nkloso seemed to know this. As one reporter said later of the Zambian space program, Nkloso really lives the Jules Verne-like character he has built up around himself. He dresses in multicolored cloaks in keeping with the African conception of a space-flying superman. He covers his head with a shockproof helmet, this is in fact from his service, and lashes a rubber bottle around his chest. Rummaging through a battered briefcase, he pulled out a space comic book. I get a lot of ideas from this, he said. So have many American and Russian scientists. 
Some people think I'm crazy, but I'll be laughing the day I plant Sandy's flag on the moon. Given his education, his history serving the British and being tortured by him, this is where he lost that tooth. Um, if you'll remember, they called him a toothless space enthusiast. It's because he lost that tooth uh, during his arrest and his political leanings. It's hard to imagine that Encloso was simply a fool or a lunatic. Now, did he seriously want to send black people to the moon? Did Sun Ross seriously want to transport black people to Saturn? Perhaps the question is not whether these two men were engaging in political satire, but why so few have imagined that they could be. The study of the history of black culture is full of theories about doubled or split identity. What W.E.B. Du Bois famously described as the peculiar sensation of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals, and one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. In Zambia, we have a saying about how subtle our sense of irony is. We don't have a yes and a no. We have two yeses, and one of them means no. And Coloso and Sun Ra lived this double no, this double consciousness, turned it into a double-edged sword. They possessed a darkly comic version of the ironic dédoublement, the ability to split oneself that Charles Baudelaire saw in the man who trips in the street and is already laughing at himself as he falls. I want to emphasize that this black humor is as important to black utopian art as the sublimity that we've seen in Incoloso and Ra's death-ridden visions of outer space. These two Afrofuturist artists don't just index absence and death, they delight in it. And they do so by riffing on the various valences of blackness as absence, as death, as the universe, and as the basis for human life, and also the black hole out of which our laughter emerges. The resonance of their aesthetic projects tells us that Afrofuturism is a Pan-African art and a political art. It is a wellspring of great humor and joy and a dark and powerful art because to conjure something from nothing is the project of Afrofuturism, black art and black politics. And so two black boys who became black men, two artists, one American, one African, each yearning in some way for the other continent. Colonized, recruited, insolent, artistic, militant, visionary. Did they really think they were going to transmolecularize Saturn or swing to the moon or voyage to Mars with 12 cats? Did they think they would take their people to outer space to save them like some kind of intergalactic Marcus Garvey? or also like Marcus Garvey, who sold tickets back to Africa but never actually set sail, were on Coloso and Ra pulling an elaborate prank on us. Well, they never broke character, these two. Never once said it was all a joke or it was just a scam or my impression has made me insane. These possibilities swirled through their work, sharpened the absurdist edge to their utopian politics. I am everything and nothing, they say to us with a wry smile, with an edge to their voice, and with stars twinkling in their eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Namwali. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm intrigued by your reading of black humor. Brought an entirely new resonance to that phrase. Um, lots and lots to talk about. Um, can I start by asking about the reception of Sun Ra's work in the United States? It was interesting to me that you were able to use the rather smug, patronizing British commentator as a, as a foil for Nicoloso. But what about Sun Ra and how Sun Ra was re received in the US? Did anybody get the joke there? Well, it's a question whether it's a joke. 
Right, so I published an essay, uh, a lot of um, this material appeared in the New York Review of Books. Um, it's an essay about the photographs of Ming Smith um, that she took of Sun Ra. And um, in response to me publishing this, I received, I wanna say five or six emails from older, um, mostly men, um, jazz aficionados who were very excited to, um, to talk and think um, about Sun Ra with me. And one of them told me a story, uh, which is that he's a medical doctor and that uh, he once was called to the emergency room and um, the nurses said, there's this man and he claims that he's from Saturn and we can't get him um, to write down his place of birth in the information packet. And he came in and it was Sun Ra. And, you know, and so he maintained this in his daily life, right? This was um, a big part of him. I think, you know, Ming, uh, I did an event with her the other day and I was asking her about the context of these photographs from the 70s, I think, or from 68. And she said, you know, he was playing in like a Hungarian bar in the basement. There were like 30 people there. It was like very low key, you know, this is, you know, and I think in general, when you look at interviews uh, of Sun Ra, um, they didn't have very much money. A lot of musicians, he would ask like the wino, you know, they'd be like, how much are you gonna pay me? And he'd be like, nothing. And then they would play with him and be like, this is the most incredible musician. So he had a kind of cult-like following, right? And Space is a Place is not, it means an independent film. It didn't launch in movie theaters like that. So, you know, but I think for the most part, the artistry of his music meant that he could be bracketed as a kind of artistic genius, right? So the, the wild, crazy things he said, um, people could kind of just put to one side as, oh, this is clearly part of his performance. Whereas with Coloso, it's much harder to tell because he was not officially a performer. In fact, he was very annoyed that his uh, space cadets uh, joined a rock group, um, a dance troupe, um, that he, he was like, they think they're performers, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm serious about this. Interesting. Okay, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, uh, just to encourage everybody out there to continue submitting them as we go forward. So Nancy Berman, uh, one of our nearest and dearest, notes that uh, Sun Ra seems to stand at the intersection between Allen Ginsberg and Earth, Wind and Fire, uh, but also notes the uh, the connection to Octavia Butler. Is there any evidence that uh, Butler was influenced by Sun Ra at all or familiar with uh, his work? She may have been, but I actually don't see that connection um, in their aesthetic is, is very different. Um, you know, Afrofuturism um, and the kind of uh, play both with ancient, ancient Egypt and with um, kind of outer space, uh, I think would have struck Octavia Butler as a little um, fantastical, <laughs> um, you know, so I think she's, she's so, so committed to real science, um, even in the, the work that we would define as fantasy, there's a kind of elaborate structure there that's very, very meticulous and precise. Um, so I don't know, and she's, yeah, she just, she strikes me as a very um, serious thinker. Uh, and when, so Mark Derry, when he um, publishes Black to the Future, that essay, is the introduction to a series of interviews. One of the interviews is with Samuel Delaney. And um, he and Octavia Butler, um, in interviews and in the afterwards to, for example, her short stories in Blood Child, very often push, a, push aside the uh, implication or imputation of a specific political point of view, a specific black political point of view. Whereas you can see Sun Ra is like very explicit and in space is the place there's the CIA, um, black politics, uh, the Black Panthers um, is much more explicit. So I think I would, I would say that there's, there's actually some slight differences there. Um, but of course, you know, she does have um, some of her, like, you know, uh, Dawn, for example, is set on a spaceship. But again, it's a spaceship that's a planet, right? It's a spaceship that's like organic. <laughs> um, uh, so it doesn't have that same kind of um, uh, Star Trek or Star Wars uh, flavor to it. It feels more like the Saturn um, <laughs> that we see on Space is the Place um, briefly. 
So we'll come back to the legacies of Afrofuturism in a moment, but I just want to ask about the context of Berkeley in the 1960s. How on earth did he get appointed uh, to <laughs> Berkeley? Did you get the opportunity to reconstruct that? I did not. No, I have no idea. But it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me because we're a public university. Um, and I say we. I only just left there. Um, so, for example, there are people from the streets of Berkeley very much bleed onto campus. Um, there's a man who has been practicing Tai Chi in the uh, antechamber of Wheeler Hall, which is the English department, which is this very, you know, Greco-Roman, you know, kind of big building just as you come onto campus. And he's every day is, pr is practicing Tai Chi barefoot in, the, in that space. Um, people from the camp, like from outside the campus can come to talks. It's, you know, it's a public university. So course, how he actually got given a course is a different question. There are decals at Berkeley where um, students can teach courses. Um, and so there are also courses taught in the Martin Luther King Center, you know, so there, there's also like different levels of course. I, I, I don't think, for example, that he had an official position in like as an adjunct in like the music department. I think it was probably one of these looser, looser forms. Interesting. So there's a couple of questions here about the legacy of uh, the figures that you've been talking about. And quite an interesting uh, observation that although it might seem that the aesthetic that you've been describing is uh, not around any longer, could you talk about the imaginative legacy of, of figures like Ra? Where do you see the, the trajectory of Afro figures having gone since the uh, 60s? I mean, I think it's still, I think it's still with us and it's had a resurgence. Um, so, you know, I, I had one uh, slide on there where I kind of flashed um, various figures, but there've been museum exhibitions, um, film, you know, Black Panther is Afrofuturism, Black right? The, the film itself, um, the comic book, you know, it, it's, it's kind of questionable, but um, the, Janelle Monet, the art oh. android, right, which harkens back to Metropolis, which is a very early work of science fiction, but is also about being an android, um, is very much part of that. Solange, uh, all of her um, performances are extremely indebted to the style oh. of Sun Ra's orchestra, the dancers. So Ming, when she talked about going to this Hungarian basement, she went because her girlfriend wanted to audition to be one of the dancers for the Sun Ra experience, right? Um, so she wasn't a musician, she wasn't a singer, she became one of the dancers. They were fire, you know, fire eaters. It was, you know, it's this kind of like revolving um, troupe. Um, and so you can see when you look at um, the uh, documentary about Sun Ra's life, A Joyful Noise, um, the, the, the style, the, the, the combination of sh uh, shimmer and color um, and the kind of uh, syncretic mashing up of Egypt and outer space is very much present in the artistic stylings of someone like Solange. Um, so it's, it's drifted a lot, I think, toward visual and um, uh, musical culture in terms of uh, literature, I think what we're seeing is a kind of explosion in Black genre fiction in general, including right. science fiction and fantasy. Um, you can trace Marlon James's um, Black Leopard Red Wolf, right? That is, that is part of an Afrofuturist legacy in the fantasy line. Right. Um, but you can also look at um, Nnedi Okorafor's Lagoon, for example, which is more strict science fiction. And again, kind of incorporates African themes, um, even though it's a Niger book. She's a Niger, a Nigerian American author. Um, so yeah, I think you see the, this legacy in, um, in all sorts of places. Um, electronica music is coming back in a big way. And I think, um, there's a lot of interest in, in these early black electronica forms and Sun Ra was a big innovator in that. Yes, in terms of the sonic dimensions, right. Yeah. Nupur Kapadi was asking about whether you see Afrofuturism represented in Lovecraft Country and Watchmen particularly. Yeah, I mean, I've, I wrote about Watchmen um, and um, 
I am writing about Lovecraft Country. Watchmen is a very interesting show to think about in terms of legacies. It, it obviously is combining certain aspects of comic books, which we saw were very influential for Incoloso, um, with um, science fiction. Lindelof, who made The Leftovers and who directed Watchmen, was obsessed with the comic book, right, which um, is really an anti-comic book, if that makes sense. It is a, it's all about making comic book heroes anti-heroes. And his decision to make it a Black Watchmen is something that I think I, I, it's hard to put, it's hard to explain, but it, it feels like a director's decision that then the writing room kind of combined together to create something Afrofuturist, right? Um, yeah. But it, I would is not- that to imply that it's not authentic? It's not that it's not authentic. I just wouldn't put it in a lineage, right? I don't think his yeah. reference points are Sun Ra or Samuel Delaney or Octavia Butler or you know um, Black No More by George Schuyler, et cetera, et cetera. I think his reference points are Marvel comic books, um, but also the Watchmen series itself, which was originally written and illustrated by British comic book artists. And then he is blackening it, which is itself a, a tradition in, um, in science fiction. So for example, Matt Johnson's Pym is a blackening of Poe's uh, narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. And so this is a tradition of in science fiction is you take a, a kind of er white text and you blacken it and it's and it's a, it, it renders things very strange and very beautiful, very interesting. But I wouldn't say that it is part of a lineage where he is looking back right to those figures. Uh, Lovecraft Country, similarly, you know, it's it's written by uh, the, the, the novel is written by a, a white novelist who you know, when the, the interview at the back of the book, um, I happen to have it <laughs> right in front of me. Uh, you know, he, he says this thing that, that um, again, makes me think that it's, it's working with a different intention. So he says, um, one of the many forms of exclusion African-Americans face was being shut out of the popular imagination. For as long as genre fiction has existed, there have been black genre fiction fans, but most of the time they were either ignored or insulted. And then he said, um, these same genre tropes offer another way of looking at and thinking about the real life history of African-Americans. And of course, tales of the supernatural are just a lot of fun. There's a reason African-Americans wanted a chance to play too. And this to me is just like, the most ignorant of African-American literature that I've ever read, because the supernatural is a huge part of the African-American literature literary tradition. So some of the work I've been doing at the New York Public Library this year is recovering, for example, a book from 1905 written by an ex-slave uh, called Anthropology is Applied to the American White Man and Negro, which includes science fictional tropes, including transforming uh, a white character into a black character using a potion, which is a plot point that is in Lovecraft Country, but he takes his inspiration from Jekyll and Hyde per his references. It's like the title of the chapter is references Jekyll and Hyde. Um, and so he's, he's taking again, a white text and blackening it, but not recognizing the long tradition of black genre fiction prior to Lovecraft Country that he could have been working with. And so what ends up, it ends up being like kind of weird in, in I don't know if those of you who've seen the show, but you know, Lovecraft himself was famously, you know, viciously racist. And one of his monsters is the Shoggoth, which is itself racialized. It is a monstrous, like misogynistic <laughs> creature that is built of too many different parts and it is a slave race and in Lovecraft Country the show we have white shoggoths and black shoggoths and black shoggoth is redundant 
Like, I'm sorry, you know? So it's, there's this very interesting thing that's happening, I think, where there's an active interest in thinking about genre fiction in relation to African-American history, not realizing that there is a history of African-American genre fiction since the 19th century. <laughs> that work of uncovering these texts, um, tracing that tradition is part of what I'm, I'm still kind of engaged in trying to do. So that brings me to my next question, is whether the two stories that you've told us tonight are part of a larger project with a number of uh, narratives about particular uh, figures who were so prominent in the development of this tradition. So the project I'm working on is a biography of Nkuloso. It is a, an expansion of um, the article that I wrote for The New Yorker that also is gonna be paired with a digital archive that will give researchers, because there's a lot of interest by young African filmmakers and writers in his life, and they want to know more about the space program. And I have all this archival material and I wanna give researchers and artists and scholars access to it. Uh, the biography is going to do some contextual work for understanding Nkoloso in the Zambian context, the Cold War context, the context of science and technology in the post-colonial moment, but also his legacy in Afrofuturism. How, why is it that he gets picked up in the first uh, decade of the 21st century as an Afrofuturist avant la lettre? Like, how does that happen? And it happens because of all of these other texts that I'm talking about, right? That are building a sense of a tradition that gets named in 92 by Mark Derry right. as Afrofuturism. Um, so the larger project is, is this biography, but it's also becoming, and this goes back to your first comment, um, an investigation into a kind of theory of Black identity that has to do with Black being, Black humor, how can we understand satire differently um, if we're looking at it from within an African context or within an African American context and within a diasporic context. So filaments of this are coming in, but it's not going to be a book about Afrofuturism. It's going to be a book about Nkoloso that uses him as an occasion to meditate on Afrofuturism. Understood. Thank you. So we'll come to our last question, which picks up on some of the themes that you mentioned in the answer to the previous one. So Phoebe Pan asks, do you see any limitations or difficulties in exploring themes of Black identity and culture in genre fiction? especially given the way that sci-fi is often received in traditional literary circles? That's a really great question. I think the travesty of Lovecraft Country, from my perspective, speaks precisely to the risks. Because the intention is well-meaning when you create a hero of a black Shoggoth. The intention is great, but you've not really thought through <laughs> the implications of the Shoggoth itself, right? So what it means is if you, if you slap race onto genre in a, in a kind of slapdash way, right. you end up recapitulating certain tropes visual tropes, especially when it's in a cinematic context or a TV context. So for example, in, in the racial transformation story in Lovecraft Country, there's a decision, there's a set of decisions and you know, I, spoiler alert, um, there's a, a set of decisions about who they cast to play the part of the black woman who transforms into a white woman and who they, who they cast to play the white woman. So they cast a, a much smaller white woman so that when she transforms back into a black woman, she bursts out of her skin. Now this hero, this black woman, this voluptuous, gorgeous, most, she's the most beautiful um, actress in the show, I believe. We end up with a visual image of her, even though she's the heroine, we end up with a visual image of her covered in flesh and blood, wielding violence multiple times. And it's simply because there was not enough consideration of 
well, we've got this really cool horror theme and we've got this really cool, amazing actress and we wanna talk about race and you threw them together without thinking about the long tradition of treating the monstrous mammy in genre fiction. So, so I think there are risks um, because you have to be cognizant of what you're depicting at a semantic level, at a narrative level, and at a visual level if you're doing it in television and at a metaphoric level. So for me, the solution to this is just read more. <laughs> the solution to this is read the long history of race transformation tales written by Black people since the 19th century, the Conjure Tales by Charles Chestnut. There's a, a great one um, there. Look at the way Black writers have dealt with genre and race for a century and a half in Africa, in the Caribbean, in the African American context. And so you suddenly so much is illuminated about what needs to be done, right? And, and instead of thinking of it as we're gonna diversify genre fiction and make it blacker, it's like genre fiction has always already been black. And so we just need to actually read that tradition and learn it um, and, and understand it. Terrific, thank you for sharing that manifesto with us. <laughs> uh, I think we can all agree that we should always read more. Namali, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you for staying up so late. It's very late. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's been a pleasure working with you and a pleasure hearing about your project. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Bye. Bye.